I'm going to talk about some stories I have as an attorney in my past. For those who don't who follow me, you know, I'm a DUI and personal injury lawyer, but I'm basically retired. I'm, I want to relate my legal experiences to the world of Tesla and particularly full self-driving. I'm wearing a Cybertruck shirt right now, elonbits.com for the shirts and for the, the stainless steel water bottle. But the things that I experienced as a lawyer, what I saw that happens in the real world or the legal world really relates to things that should matter to people who are looking at the future of FSD. So DUI stories are kind of interesting. It's what, what I've seen over time, number one, I think, let's start with DUI. A lot of people think if you're arrested for DUI, you're guilty. If you're arrested for something, the police must have a good reason for you arresting you. And something like five or 10% of all Florida drunk driving arrests blow a blood alcohol content that's legal. And they still get charged with DUI. They still get their picture posted on the internet, accusing them of drunk driving. Even if they blow a legal number, this is one of the bizarre things, they still get held for eight hours. First of all, there are real drunk driving accidents. There are real drunk drivers who shouldn't be driving. We can all agree on that. But I, I've seen it from the other side, which is I've represented people that I genuinely believe are innocent. And I'm gonna tell you some of those stories. And that I think the important thing to think about in this context is when we're looking at the future, when we're looking at, hi Mitch, when we're looking at the future, we're looking at a future of self-driving cars. What happens to traffic enforcement? What happens to car accidents? What happens to car accident lawyers? I've, I've literally made in my career revenue, not in my pocket, not in my bank account, but I've literally made millions of dollars on personal injury cases and drunk driving cases and marijuana cases and traffic cases, you know, speeding ticket cases, that, that type of thing. I, you know, as an attorney in New York, I generated a tremendous amount of revenue. Revenue isn't in the, in the pocket, right? At expenses along the way, but I literally generated millions of dollars on this. And I think all that's going away. I, every time you drive down the road and you see a billboard, every time you're watching TV and you see a TV ad for a personal injury lawyer, that's going away. Every, you know, there, there, there's not going to be a need for personal injury lawyers, for car accident lawyers in an age when the cars drive themselves. And this is a great thing. This is a great thing. But, you know, what's comical is, I, well, so I have a video. If you check my YouTube channel, I have a video, 10 industries that Elon Musk will destroy. And the legal industry is going to get clobbered by self-driving cars, boring company tunnels. There's a lot of, you know, the, the Starship going point to point, uh, the Hyperloop, a lot of industries are going to be wrecked. But particularly the the legal world is going to have a massive it's going to have a massive impact on the legal world to have self-driving cars and the medical world, too. Let me just give you an example of a story. I represented this client. This was in the town of Stillwater, New York. If you're familiar with upstate New York, this is on the east side of Saratoga Lake. Client and his wife are at his wife's parents house and they have dinner and they have a couple glasses of wine and they're driving and at some point my client hits a dog this is at night right a dog steps in front of his car he hits the dog he realizes he hit a dog he turns around and drives back he sees the injured dog in the road he parks in the roadway blocking traffic from hitting the dog with his flashers on he goes up to the nearest house and says hey i just hit a dog would you please call the police now i would say this is not behavior that's consistent with a drunk driver Right, a genuine drunk driver who knows he's drunk, who's malicious, is not going to call the police to the scene of an accident that he's involved in. He's going to drive away. But this guy actually is genuinely interested in the welfare of the dog. The dog did die. He's generally interested in making sure that the scene is taken care of. The police arrive at the scene. This is the Stillwater Town Police Department. The police officer approaches, you know, says who was driving and he raises his hand. You know, none of this is the behavior you would expect of a drunk driver. And they take him to that back to the police station. They have him blow in a machine. There really isn't. I mean, even the, the guy at the house that he went to who said, hey, would you call the police? That guy didn't think he was drunk. The way they get to getting him to the police station is kind of odd because he's not showing the behavior of a drunk driver. The cop, li I'm sorry, I'm going to say this. Some police officers lie, as in nearly all of them that I've seen in my entire career. Every criminal case I've seen, they lie some. I'm sorry, there's a rare exception. They almost always lie. So they lied to justify bringing him back to the police station. There was this quirk. There's this uh, thing in most drunk driving, in most states, where before you have them blow in the machine, you have to watch them for 20 minutes to make sure they don't burp, vomit, stick something in their mouth, etc., because that can provoke a false result from the machine. And it was very clear from the paperwork they didn't observe him for 20 minutes. And I'm asking the cop, well, what time did you get him to the station? And ultimately, I get him to admit 
to tell me that he got him to the station 20 minutes before he arrested him. Because he needed that much time to be able to claim that he had 20 minutes of observation. But the problem is that he, he pushed it so far back that he had to go back in time from the time that he arrested him at the scene to the time he got him back to the station. Uh, the jury deliberated for four hours before saying not guilty. He blew, he blew a .16 on the blood alcohol uh, breath test device. Now, I got himself and three other witnesses saying he had two glasses of wine four hours earlier. He's sober. He's got no problems. I got the guy at the house saying... You know, he didn't see any signs of intoxication. So there's a lot of evidence in our favor. And it's unusual. Most of my drunk driving cases, my clients alone. He has no witnesses to support him. Um, but this is a guy whose life, he, he lost his license for like a year waiting for his case to go to trial. Because in New York State, in many states, you lose your license pending trial. And he didn't have a job. So he didn't have a justification for getting what's called a hardship license. So his wife pretty much had to drive him everywhere. And, you know, this is a guy who should not have had to go through all of this, but he did have to go through all of this because of our DUI system. And, you know, this is a future where, first of all, if you are arrested for DUI in the future, we're going to have a robo-taxi world where it's going to be a lot easier to get around, a lot more cost-effective to get around. I have had clients who relied on Uber when they couldn't drive, which is a nice new feature of our society that it's now less expensive and more convenient where people who are accused of drunk driving or lose their license for drunk driving, they can get around in a less expensive manner, in a more convenient manner, now that Uber and Lyft are out there. Uh, yeah, Mitch, I agree. This is, you know, this guy is, but this guy's a good guy. The, Mitch says this is why people don't want to get involved any longer, but this guy's a good guy, and he has, it has, it has not occurred to him. One, one of the things about criminal law is everyone thinks that criminal law is about the police arresting someone else. They never think it's going to be them. This guy, it just never occurred to him that he would be arrested for DUI. He knew he wasn't drunk. DWI in New York State, by the way. He wasn't drunk. He didn't believe he was drunk. He didn't think there was any reason to be concerned. I, I don't think I have a copy of the book with me. I wrote a book called Fair DUI, which I'm going to talk about a little later. Um, how to handle your, basically, how to understand what happens in a traffic stop and how to handle yourself. And, you know, one of the things is you don't talk to the police. Like you've all heard some lawyers say don't talk to the police. This is a great example of it. He admitted he was driving the car. Now the police officer can say, you were driving the car. I think you're drunk. Take you back to the station. Um, P. Byrne asks, have I ever had civil forfeiture involved in one of my cases? Uh, I think I've seen civil. It's not very common in upstate New York, where I did most of my work. So I saw, I think, one or two cases involving civil forfeiture, but it was never. I'm aware of the issue of civil forfeiture, but it's not something that comes up in my work. And it tends to be more of a drug thing. There are places where they, they take your car. They impound your car uh, and they try to get forfeiture of a DUI car. But I, I, I think in Long Island they do that sometimes, but I just haven't seen a lot of that. So no. So that's an example of a guy that I genuinely believe was innocent, who was prosecuted in this system. And, you know, and I mean, I mean, multiple witnesses saying he's sober and you, the cops were like Keystone cops. They were terrible. They were incompetent. Uh, small town police officers tend to have a lot less training than big city police officers or state police officers. There's still a lot of incompetence in the state police and city police. There's still a lot of dishonesty in state police and city police. I'm sorry if you're if you're a fan of cops. I'm just telling you a harsh reality. As an attorney, questioning police officers and drunk driving cases and a lot of other cases, they lie a lot. Whether it's conscious, whether it's they're trained to lie, you don't have to like me for saying it. I'm just telling you. Ask any defense lawyer, they're going to tell you it's true. They just the cops just lie, and I'm a defense lawyer, so and I, I saw it as the prosecutor. I, I worked in a prosecutor's office. And I saw it when I worked in a prosecutor's office when I wasn't a defense lawyer. That's a DUI story. I think another really good DUI story I can tell you, drunk driving story I can tell you, is I had a client who was arrested. He was in his apartment parking lot listening to his car stereo. Car doors were open. Engine was running. Wasn't going anywhere. Under New York law, if he's not going anywhere and he's not coming from somewhere, he's not driving. In, in some states, like I think in Florida, that actually would be drunk driving. That doesn't mean juries like it. So it was a close call whether this was really drunk driving or not. And there's a lot of things going on. And he was hammered. He, I think he blew a .32. I went and saw him later uh, in the case. Went to stop by his house. He was hammered when I saw him at his house. This guy was just, I think this guy had a serious alcohol problem. But he wasn't driving. And in fact, the story was that he was outside in the parking lot listening to the car stereo because his daughter was harassing him because she wanted him to drive her somewhere. And he didn't want to drive her anywhere because he knew he was drunk. So he's deliberately trying not to drink and not to drive while drunk. And the police arrest him for drunk driving. 
And there was a whole mess in this case. The cop ended up showing up. He, he didn't show up to court initially. And when they got him to court, he's wearing like a wife beater, you know, an undershirt. He's not even wearing a full shirt. He looked like hell. His testimony was awful. But, you know, fundamentally, he wasn't driving. But he still got arrested. He still got his license suspended pending prosecution. He still went through all these hoops. He still had to pay a lawyer a lot of money. I forget how much he paid me. Um, I think he still owes me money now that I think about it. But um, I, I don't chase people for money. I try to get my money up front. If they don't pay me, I send them a couple of nice letters and then let it go. But, you know, this is another case of a guy who, we, he was drunk and he was in his car, but he wasn't driving. And he shouldn't have been prosecuted. And the jury... Five, as I, the jury came back in 20 minutes with a not guilty verdict. What we heard afterwards was that the jury walked in the jury room and they all said not guilty. And they said, all right, let's make it look like we thought about it. And they waited 20 minutes and talked about something else. And then they came out and said not guilty. So they knew right away. Every juror was like not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. But they, they made it look good. So that's just a couple examples of drunk driving cases I've seen. Yeah, Kara says, Kara, for those who don't know Kara in the chat, is my girlfriend. Kara says, in Massachusetts, the keys are in ignition, OUI, operating under the influence. Every state's different. Just because the law says it's drunk driving doesn't mean a jury's going to find the person guilty. If the jury doesn't like it, they can say not guilty, and the court, the judge can't make them. The law can't make them say guilty. And most people believe that drunk driving is when you're driving. If you have an intent to drive, if you have, you know... If you were trying to drive, whatever, this guy had the keys. He didn't have, to have the keys ignition. The engine was running, but he was not trying to drive the car. So I, you know, I think the key point here is we're heading towards a future where we basically eliminate drunk driving. And one of the things that I think people don't know is if you're convicted of, I've had, I've had innocent clients who plead guilty to some form of drunk driving because the consequences of going to trial and losing are so severe. People don't realize this. Innocent people will plead guilty when they are facing criminal prosecution, even when they're innocent. Uh, it's very, honestly, like just for an example, I think Tiger Woods was innocent in his DUI on Jupiter. I, I went through the case. Uh, I genuinely believe he was innocent, but he pled guilty because social, you know, pressure, you know, public pressure, whatever. He pled guilty to something to get the case resolved. I'd have to go through the details of why I think he's not guilty. That's a long conversation and why the police, the police made a bunch of mistakes. But, you know, Tiger's not a guy who wants to have a public fight over a drunk driving case and get bad press and all that. And I have a video. If you check my channel, if you search my, my YouTube channel for Tiger Woods, you'll find that video where I go through what happened in that case and why I think he's not guilty and what the police did wrong. I, I look forward to a future where Tesla delivers self-driving cars and people no longer need um, to drive a car to get around and we end up with a much better, uh, we, we end up much safer. I mean, one of the things is like, here in Florida, I've, I've heard stories of people who get like their 20th drunk driving arrest. I represented a guy recently. I represented a guy in New York who had a sixth drunk driving arrest. Uh, as in, you know, five prior felon, pri five prior DUI convictions, DWI convictions, and I represent him in a sixth. I represented a guy here not long ago in, in, in Broward County, Florida. I'm in Broward County now. Fort Lauderdale's Broward County. I'm in Coral Springs. And he was arrested for DUI, and it was his fourth, it would, it would have been his fourth conviction. I ended up getting it. I got him a really good deal because they didn't turn the... <laughs> They either didn't turn the dash cam on when they pulled him over or they're hiding the dash cam. There's all kinds of things that happen in a case. I genuinely believe he wasn't drunk. That's a whole other conversation. But this guy shouldn't have been arrested because they didn't have a good reason to stop his vehicle. It was a violation of his Fourth Amendment rights. Um, but we made a deal. He pled guilty to reckless driving, paid a fine, jumped through some hoops, and he's done. So one of the things that I think people don't grasp is when we penalize people for drunk driving, we basically take away their ability to drive. And that's very difficult for people. And there's actually sort of a, a soft approach in some places to people who get caught driving on a suspended license on the theory that, well, they have to get to work. OK, well, why are we suspending their license then if we're going to be soft on them when they get arrested for driving on a suspended license? I'm going to disagree with my girlfriend on this. She says driving is a privilege. Once you have a driver's license, you have a property right in your driver's license. So the notion of a difference between a privilege and a right is something that people commonly say. I, I've heard that argument all the time. She's going she's gonna to throw something at me now. The notion that it's a privilege, not a right, is, is a false legal doctrine. A legal doctrine is when you get a license, whether it's a professional license, let's say you're a licensed mental health counselor, you get a license to be a mental health counselor, that's a license that you have a property right in and it can't be taken away without due process. And your driver's license is a property right and it can't be taken away without due process. So the idea that your privilege can be taken away, when, you, when people say it's a privilege, it's like, well, we can just take it away, poof. No, you have to prove the person's guilty, you have to give them due process, and 
it's actually one of the problems that I have, a particular problem I have with the DUI system as it is, is they will take your license away before they prove you guilty. And that's generally the largest consequence of a first DUI, first drunk driving conviction or first drunk driving arrest is losing your license. Well, they take it away before. In New York, it actually works this way. You get arrested for drunk driving. If you plead guilty, they give you a hardship license right away. If you plead not guilty, they make you wait 20 days to get a license. So if you want to be able to drive, you have a direct incentive to plead guilty, even when you're innocent. And a lot of people don't have the resources to live without their driver's license. And literally, if you plead guilty, you will get a license and continue to drive um, without interruption, where if you're innocent, you might lose your license for a year. It's a crazy, like the client, the first story I told you, he lost his license for a year. He was not guilty. So, uh, yeah, it, it's a guilty before, before, as Mitch says, it's a guilty before being proven innocent system. You don't have to agree with me on drunk driving law or how drunk driving is handled. But what we can all agree is we would like a world where we don't have drunk drivers anymore. And the way forward that Tesla is pushing for us is full self-driving is going to enable a world of robo-taxis where it's going to be less expensive to ride in a robo-taxi than it is to own a car. And there's a key point here. The Tasha Keeney of ARK Invest came up with this ballpark number that the average cost per mile that the average American spends on their car is about 70 cents a mile. But people with drunk driving convictions have higher insurance rates. So they pay more per mile for their car. People with poor credit pay more. Uh, they pay more for the car because their car loan is more expensive. They pay more for car insurance because of their poor credit. There's all kinds of things that, that raise the cost for some people. So if you have somebody with multiple drunk driving convictions, their cost of insurance is very high. If you get robo-taxi down to a dollar a mile, that might be good enough that it makes sense for them to switch and never drive again. And, and that's really kind of a big goal is can we get the people who have alcohol problems to stop driving and ride in robo-taxis instead? And I think that future of people riding in robo-taxis is going to be a big step forward. The other side of this, I want to talk about the car accident side of this. I had a client, um, his name's Dave. Dave was sitting on his motorcycle. He had a Harley. He stopped in traffic. There's two lanes going this direction that's sort of veering off to the right. And there's a lane coming the other way, one or two lanes coming the other way. And the road coming the other way bends. So the driver coming the other way apparently fell asleep at the wheel and drove straight into Dave on his motorcycle and drove, driving an SUV, drove him into another SUV. Uh, major collision. Dave lost his uh, part of his foot in the accident itself. There's a chunk of his foot in the roadway after the accident. Dave, by the way, is a tough guy, served in the Marines. I don't think you can say former Marine because you're always a Marine, but really, really tough guy, big, strong guy. And he was hospitalized for, I want to say 45 days. I think he was in ICU for like 17 days and they were trying to save his ankle um, because if you can save the ankle, it's a lot better for walking. And ultimately they had infections. He wasn't able to save his ankle and they had to do an amputation above, uh, above the, below the knee amputation Below the knee is better than above the knee, more range of motion by having the knee. But Dave, you know, had experienced a really traumatic injury. I ended up getting a $3.85 million verdict on that case. I did not pocket $1.3 million, as you might think I would have from the attorney's fee. That's a long conversation. But I would love to see a world where these accidents stop happening. I, I've made a lot of money handling personal injury cases, both as a defense lawyer for Allstate, working for a judge uh, who saw a lot of personal injury cases, and then as a plaintiff's lawyer. And I'm happy to see a world where there's no accidents or a lot fewer accidents and personal injury lawyers make a lot less money. Um, it's actually one of the perverse things that I've seen when I talk to lawyer friends. Like I want to legalize marijuana. I have a friend who's a, a lawyer who defends marijuana cases and he smokes marijuana every day. And when I said we should legalize marijuana, he's like, no, I make too much money defending marijuana cases. And I made a lot of money defending marijuana cases, but I don't care about, I want a better society and my personal financial interest is not more important than that. I was talking to a friend who's a personal injury lawyer about how Robo taxis are going to eliminate car accidents and then we won't make any money on car accidents. And he was horrified. Like you, there's this episode of the Simpsons. I should have this clip where what's the guy's name is Lionel Hutz. Lionel Hutz is a, is a lawyer in the Simpsons episode. And somebody said, can you imagine a world without lawyers and Lionel Hutz envisions a world where everybody's dancing in a circle in a field. Can you imagine a world without lawyers? Oh, and he goes, Ugh. you know, everybody's happy. That's like a horrible thing for lawyers. Let me just turn to questions here. Kara, my girlfriend says, then who is at fault if the robo taxi hits someone? So the idea is that robo taxis will be much less likely to hit anyone. 
Uh, but if a robo taxi hits someone, if if it's a quote level five vehicle, as in it's the the driver, the owner of the vehicle has no supervision, it's running on say Tesla's full self driving software, then Tesla's liable if it's the vehicle's fault. And the beautiful thing is you'll have cameras. Ultimately, you're just going to see a lot fewer accidents. I'm not saying it's going to be perfect. I'm not saying there's going to be no accidents. There's going to be a lot fewer accidents. They will be a lot safer in a lot of different ways. I think in the long run, robo taxis will be much lighter weight. So if the, because they're more efficient if they weigh less and we won't once their crashes become rare, you won't need all the structure and everybody knows oh, I've got my pod car startup. My pod car is going to weigh like 400, 500 pounds that this will greatly reduce the, the severity of collisions because the vehicles weigh a lot less. It's kind of a nightmare in the world where you have still have 5000 pound SUVs and you got 500 pound pod cars driving around. If a 500, 5,000 pound SUV hits a 500 pound pod car, that's not going to be pretty. But going down the road far enough, all the vehicles will be self-driving and crashes will be extremely rare. And that's really good for eliminating accidents. And you see that if you eliminate all the car accidents, how many fewer emergency room visits are there? How many fewer chiropractor visits are there? How much less money is spent on car insurance and medical care for, from resulting from car accidents? How many jobs are lost in those industries? You know, that's a big deal. How many personal injury? I know everyone's crying at the idea that personal injury lawyers and criminal defense lawyers are going to lose work. You're all, I know you're all sad right now. You're all terrified at the concept of out-of-work lawyers. It's very upsetting, isn't it? Mitch says, insurance, indie, automotive, insurance industry, automotive repair, car dealers, and ICE mechanics, also not future outlook. Elon is going to have many unknown consequences influencing the future. Again, I would suggest... Check out um, my video, 10 Industries. Just search my ch my YouTube channel for 10 Industries. I've got a video where I talk about a lot of this stuff. There's probably more. The Duke of URL. Oh, that's Brian. I don't, Brian, I don't know what you mean by 3333333. Victor Block says, I joined NewYorkTimes.com. They had a real hit piece back in, on Tesla back, I think, in October at FSD. Yes, New York Times just had, I think it's, it's more recent than October. The New York Times did a hit piece on Tesla and FSD. There's this massive uh bias we just we just had a room on twitter spaces where uh the tesla q community was bashing elon and fsd and everything and it's we're heading towards a world i want to st stress this point there are about a million people a year worldwide who die in car accidents and if tesla is able to accelerate the introduction of self-driving by one year right if if globally the transition to self-driving cars happens a year earlier. It means a million lives are saved. So anybody who's fighting, again, so this fear, the New York Times raised this fear that there's some sort of FSD testing is dangerous when there's been zero accidents involving FSD beta drivers. I'm an FSD beta driver. There's about 12,000 of us now. We've driven probably millions of miles at this point, and we had zero crashes. Um, so it's not, but even if there were crashes involving FSD beta, if the goal is to, if, if getting it done sooner means you save a million lives in aggregate by, say, by getting it done a year sooner, then we should be pushing to get it done sooner. We shouldn't be stalling. Anybody who's stalling the development of FSD is killing people. And they don't like it when I say it, but it's just practical reality. If you see the reality that at the point that robo-taxis are real and they dramatically reduce the number of accidents and there's a million people worldwide who die from, from uh, tra traffic accidents, if you accelerate that transition to self-driving cars globally by a year then you save a million lives because there's a million people killed a year worldwide if you look at america if you accelerate the transition i think about forty thousand people in america die in car accidents if you accelerate the transition in america by one year you save forty thousand american lives it's a big deal yeah i and to brian's question yes i believe that we're going to see the largely the end of personal injury lawyers now Car accident cases aren't the only things that personal injury lawyers do. There are other things that they do, but it's probably about half of the work. The ballpark guess about half of the work of personal injury lawyers is car accidents. You still have slip and falls. You still have dog bites. You still have, uh, you know, other premises liability cases where somebody gets hurt, you know, slipping on ice or, you know, some sort of dangerous condition on a property. But my, I mean, I was at Allstate, so it was kind of a, a tainted experience. I would like to see us transition to a world where we have fewer car accidents, fewer drunk driving incidents, um, speeding tickets. I'm, I, I, was work, I was living in Palm Beach County. I'm in Broward County now. When I was at, I was at a seminar and I was told that there are 15,000 traffic tickets a month, traffic cases a month in, in Palm Beach County. Now, Palm Beach County is a population of a million and a half people. So you figure there's 200 times that much uh, globe in the United States. 300,000 traffic tickets a month. In the United States, I think that's within reason. I think there's a couple million a year in New York State, if not more. 
So this, this crazy amount of traffic tickets that are happening that create a lot of burden on the courts. You know, if you, if you ever hear people saying that the courts are overburdened, well, let's get rid of the traffic cases. Let's get rid of the drunk driving cases. Let's get rid of all the drug cases start with a traffic stop. What's the basis for a traffic stop? Just just here's a like a, a picture here. The way a typical drug case starts is someone's driving down the road. The police see them make a left turn without signaling or a lane change without signaling. They pull them over. And they, I think Sandra Bland is an example that she made a lane change without signaling. She got pulled over and she ends up getting arrested and dies in jail, right? In a world of self-driving cars, we don't really need traffic enforcement anymore. The cars are inherently safe. That's going to be an interesting transition. If you check my channel, I don't know what you'd search for on my channel. You go back a year or more. I, I did a bunch of interviews. I think I have a playlist on this. I did a bunch of interviews with politicians, how self-driving cars will change the future. And we, will we still need a DMV? Will we still need traffic cops? Will we still need all this, you know, working all these uh, court employees? And politicians look like deer in the headlights when you ask them these questions, because the, the last thing they want to say is they're going to eliminate jobs, right? But that's what really would need to happen is you wouldn't need, and half of all criminal cases start with a traffic stop. They, somebody gets pulled over, the cops ask questions, they find marijuana in the car, they find cocaine in the car, whatever. All of a sudden, if you eliminate all this, then there's no problem. Um, Brian, the Duke of URL, asks, how will the counties handle the loss in traffic ticket revenue? The answer to that question is that there will be a loss in traffic ticket revenue, sure, and you know criminal cases lead to revenue as well. But the cost of enforcing the traffic laws, the cost of enforcing the criminal laws, is generally much higher than the revenue generated by the tickets. Uh, you know, don't forget that cop got paid, the judge got paid, the prosecutor got paid, maybe the public defender got paid. There's a lot of money that goes into the system. You got to pay, you know, maintenance costs on the building. You got to pay maintenance costs on the police department. There's a lot of expenses that go into writing traffic tickets and the, doing criminal cases. The revenue that's generated is 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 less than the cost of the system. But you're you're looking at a future where, you know, if if we have forward thinking politicians and we don't, but if we had forward thinking politicians, there would be a recognition: Hey, we're not going to need a local DMV anymore because we're not going to need a local DMV anymore because at a certain point people are going to stop bothering to get licensed, or we're going to need much smaller local DMVs, or maybe we'll just do uh, licensing at the state level. Because my take on it is: so so Brian's in the chat. Uh, Brian and I are not poor. I, I don't know everybody else in the chat. I'm guessing if you're in the chat, you're you're not poor. Um, we can afford to own cars. If cars get much more expensive to own, we might still own cars because we can afford it. There's a lot of people who are living on the edge who really, you know, they're worried about making their next rent payment. They're worried about making their next mortgage payment. They, you know, they've got bills to pay. They're behind on their bills. And a robo-taxi world is going to save the average American about $5,000 a year. If they're spending 70 cents a mile on their car, driving more than 10,000 miles a year, and this knocks it down to 25 cents a mile, which is ARK Invest's projection of what robo-taxi pricing is going to be in the future at some point, and you figure it's 12,000 miles a year, you're saving about $5,000 a year on one car. If it's a family with two cars, you're saving them $10,000 a year. Um, that is a huge benefit to a lot of people. And you know, while I can pay an extra 5,000 a year because I want to own my own car, there's an awful lot of people like, wait, I'm going to save five or $10,000 a year by not owning a car. And then I never have to worry about getting an oil change. I never have to worry about replacing tires or replacing windshield wipers or checking the brakes or filling the tires, uh, buying a new car, selling an old car, shopping for car insurance, all the hassles that we take it for granted because we own cars and we've just been doing that way. We probably spend a minimum of 10 hours a year and maybe it's 20 hours a year dealing with the hassles of owning a car. And a really good example that it's just really simple. You go to the mall and the parking lot's full. And right now you got to park a quarter mile away from the mall and, and walk in. RoboTaxi drops you off in front, picks you up in front. If it's raining out, RoboTaxi picks you up. You don't have to go very far in the rain to get, get to your car. If it's cold out, the RoboTaxi's warm when you get to it. If it's hot out, the RoboTaxi air conditioning's on when you get to it. It's much more convenient in a RoboTaxi world. It saves the average individual a lot of money. Um, yeah, Kara says you don't have to worry about getting in the car with a stranger, too. That's one of the issues with Uber is you never know about the driver. Six foot tall male, I don't really worry about who the driver is. But if, if you imagine if you're, a, if you're a small woman and you get in, the, in an Uber with a, a driver who's man, a man, he might not behave that well. That might, may, might be uncomfortable for some people. Cocky jerk, and I don't care. and That never bothered me. But I understand that some women uh, feel frustrated in those encounters. A lot of situations like that. Victor says, many of us 40 plus or 50 plus will choose to keep a car for a while, but younger people will dump them for robo-taxi. I agree, Victor, that adoption will be more common for young people, but I really think it's about wealth and income. 
that if you are relatively poor or lower middle class and you're struggling to make your rent payments and you're struggling to... I've just heard stories. We were talking today in a clubhouse room about how much rents are going up. If you're 45 years old and you're having struggling to make your rent payment and I can save you $5,000 a year by hopping in robo taxis, are you sure you're not going to save the $5,000 a year? You know, I, I think it depends on who you are and how much money you have. You know, if you've got, if you're like me and you've got a lot of Tesla stock and you got money banked away and you can afford to waste money, then okay. But there's a lot of people, $5,000 a year is a lot of money. That's a lot of cigarettes if you buy cigarettes. You know, that's a, lot of, that's a lot of beer. Whatever it is that you want to spend money on, do you want to spend it on maintaining a car that you don't really need anymore? Or do you want to spend it on the stuff you want to spend it on? Or do you want to bank it and put it into Tesla stock like I do? If we get to that world, I think we're looking at getting to that world. The 25 cents a mile, I think, is a ways away. I, I don't think I don't think 25 cents a mile is happening before 2030. Uh, we'll see how fast Tesla rolls out robo taxis. We'll see if my pod car startup ends up, you know, becomes legal on U.S. roads or something. I suppose it's possible we're going to see a big acceleration of that. I do think we're going to start seeing the transition within two or three years where there's going to be significant robo-taxi presence on the road. Like, let's say three, four years from now, there will be a significant robo-taxi presence on the roads. And a lot of people, the people who have, this is actually one of the beauties of what's coming is, the people who are most likely to have an accident are also the people who have the highest cost per mile of driving a car. Because their insurance rates are higher, they're probably a poor credit, and their cost of financing the car is higher. So they're more likely to switch sooner. So the roads may get safer even quicker because I'm going to ballpark and say that 10% of the drivers cause 90% of the accidents. It might be 20 and 80 or, you know, 5 and 95 or something like that. As in 5% of the drivers cause 95% of the accidents. I don't know the exact numbers. If you have a, a, a 16-year-old and they're, um, they're driving, the, your insurance, I think my insurance costs when my daughter got her driver's license, I think it went up like $2,500 a year uh, for one kid. You know, because the the sixteen year old is more expensive to insure. Well, if the, I had even then, I argued, I lost this argument to my ex. I wanted my my daughter to just take Ubers and not bother getting a driver's license. Why pay twenty? You know, she wasn't going that much. The cost of her taking Ubers every once in a while would have been less than the cost of that. Uh, Mitch, it turns out in Florida, I don't think the co increase cost was any different for men, or younger men, or younger women. But I do think it's true in some states that younger men raise raise insurance rates more. Victor says, heard today on the radio, many banks are eliminating fees, even for bounce checks. That's because bank lobbies are empty. Younger people using Venmo, et cetera. I have younger tenants with finance degrees and they don't know how to write a check. I think I know someone else who doesn't know how to write a check, but I was just in a bank lobby and it was full. I, I haven't seen empty bank lobbies, frankly. I, I think bank lobbies are plenty busy. I mean, actually, one of the banks that I go to is often empty, but a lot of the banks that I go to are full. I think it just depends. Um, but we're we're seeing a lot of change in society. Let me see if I had... I just wanted to tell you another story, a couple more stories. I represented a client. It's a black guy driving a motorcycle in a relatively rural area near Albany, New York. I, I handled a lot of cases in the Albany, New York area. This was on the east side of the Hudson River, for those who are familiar with Columbia County. Driving a motorcycle. Cops saw him. Uh, they decided to go after him. And they wrote him like 13 tickets. It's a total like 36 points with 11 points, you lose your license. I'm going to say that there was some, I, I don't want to say there was racial bias, but maybe there was racial bias and how this guy got written tickets. It's not the only time I've seen it, uh, but you know, this guy got written like a ridiculous, like 13 tickets or something like that. 11 tickets, 13 tickets. I was able to work it out with the prosecutor and he got, I think I got him down to six points instead of 36 points. And you know, he paid hefty fines or whatever. I um, mean, you know, I'm not saying he was innocent completely. He was driving too fast, but they just jacked him. It's one of those things that police can do. Police really have a lot of power in traffic stop situations, and they can write tickets that aren't really just. And an another example of that is I represented a client. It was uh, I don't know if people know what a Hasidic Jew is. It's like a very, very religious sect of Judaism. Uh, he was based in New York City. There's this community of Hasidic Jews, and particularly in New York City, for some reason, he was driving up to Montreal or something, and he was in this, like, rest area, and for, uh, I think the cop turned on his lights to approach the car. I think he was parked in the wrong spot, and the cop was just wanted to tell him he was parked in the wrong spot, and the kid panicked. He was, like, you know, 17 years old or whatever, didn't have any experience with police. He just panicked, and he started driving. He panicked and drove away from the cop and drove the wrong way on the, on the North, Adirondack North way. Now, he was an idiot, right? But the cop wrote him a bunch of tickets. You know, in a, in a robo-taxi world, this doesn't happen. You know, inexperienced drivers, we're going to get to the point where you're not going to bother teaching your kid to drive a car. 
I, I really think we're we're almost we're, we're probably almost there already for a lot of people that you shouldn't be bothering to teach your kids to drive a car, get them Uber and let them ride an Uber, and then the robo taxi world is coming. They and you know they don't need to drive a car. There's no particular. We're heading towards a world where there's no advantage in knowing how to drive a car or a trivial advantage. Mitch says easily recognized you the long beards. I don't get it, Mitch. Am I a long beard? Is that what you're saying? So I think the one other thing I wanted to talk about. I made notes about what I wanted to talk about. So for those who follow me enough, you may have know. You may know I wrote a book called Fair DUI. Fair DUI is a book about. How to handle yourself in a traffic stop, what happens in a traffic stop, what particularly happens when police decide to take a traffic stop and turn it into a, DW, a drunk driving investigation. There's a, a manual from the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration as a drunk driving defense lawyer. I've read that manual a bunch of times. I'm familiar with how they're trained. You know, fundamentally, police, some police, many police abuse their power. When you are stopped, what you'd like to believe is that the police are only only treat the bad guys that way. What you don't realize is the minute they pull you over, you're one of the bad guys. And you might encounter a good cop and you might encounter a bad cop. You might encounter a smart cop. You might encounter a dumb cop. You might encounter a smart, evil cop. You might encounter a good, dumb cop. There's unfortunately three of those four outcomes are bad for you. So and we'd like to think that 95 percent of the cops are smart and good. No, they're not that many smart cops, and there's plenty of cops who aren't so good. And so I believe you need to protect yourself in a traffic stop all the more so when you're sober. Um, in particular, let's suppose you had a glass of wine three hours ago. And that's another story I want to tell really quick. The, the obstetrician gynecologist who delivered both of my children <clears throat> was at a, a show at Proctor's in Schenectady, New York, with uh, friends, had two glasses of wine at the show, was driving home with another OBGYN and that OBGYN's daughter, 16-year-old daughter in the car, got stopped, got arrested for drunk driving. Mult many witnesses to say she was sober, including the OBGYN in the car with her, because there was a kid in the car and, it was, and there was a new law in New York State that made it a felony to, for drunk driving with a kid in the car. They charged, she was, the, she was like one of the first felony charges on this, on this law. I forget the name, Megan's Law or something like that. And it was devastating to her. And, you know, even though there was a whole bunch of crazy things that happened in the case, the cop retired and moved to Alaska. He found out they weren't giving her a deal because they were trying to make a show of it. And he sent them a letter saying, if you don't give her a deal, I'm not coming for trial. Crazy stuff. And she, anyways, she ends up pleading guilty to something. He, I, I know a lot of inside facts in this case. I genuinely believe she was innocent. Um, and I have very positive, strong feelings towards this woman because she delivered both of my children and treated my ex very well. I genuinely think they would have had trouble convicting her because it would be hard to get a jury who they would be questioning jurors and some juror would say, oh, she saved my, my wife's life. She saved my kid's life. And the jurors are going to the other jurors are going to hear that and be predisposed in her favor. And there were a lot of good facts, but ultimately she couldn't risk losing on a felony and losing her medical license. She was so devastated by the experience. She moved out of town. She moved to a small town outside because she just so stressed out by the experience. Um, very, very unpleasant result. So the fair DUI thing, I don't have the flyer handy. I keep it in my car. It says, uh, you hold it up on the window and it says, uh, I, I remain silent. No searches. I want my lawyer. There's some instructions to the cop, depending on what state you're in, what the instructions are. And the idea is you don't roll down your window and you don't talk. And that interferes with that National Highway Transportation Safety Administration training, the things that cops are trained to do to, to advance the investigation. Do you have slurred speech? If you don't speak, they can't say you have slurred speech. Do you have, um, do they detect the odor of alcoholic beverage emanating from the car? If you don't roll down the window, they can't smell alcohol coming out of the car. By the way, alcohol has no smell. Alcohol is odorless. So they say, I detected the strong odor of alcoholic beverage emanating from the vehicle. Who talks like that? The strong odor of alcoholic beverage? What did it smell like? I've, I've, had, I've had this question many times. If I've asked the police officer, what did it smell like? Blank stare. They don't have an answer. They don't know what it smelled like. They just wrote down in their notes, strong odor of alcoholic beverage. Was it beer? Was it wine? Was it whiskey? What did it smell like? They don't know. They're lying. They, they wrote it down in their notes because that's what they're trained to write down. And when they get to, to the court, they just say what they're trained to say. And then they don't have an answer. Wouldn't it be nice if we got to a world where you don't have to worry about that? And I, I genuinely believe this is the right way of handling the encounter. You shouldn't have to roll down your window because you have a right to uh, your Fourth Amendment right to privacy on, on what's inside your car. And for the cop to want to, you roll down your window is a search and seizure issue. What's his reason for getting you to roll down the window? Because he wants to smell inside the car. 
That's a Fourth Amendment issue. Wouldn't it be nice if we got to a world where the, the cars are driving themselves and they're inherently safe? And then can you imagine your local government officials saying, you know what, we don't need police to make traffic stops anymore, which wipes out like ridiculous share of the work that police do in many towns and many counties and state police. Like, you know, New York State Police has a whole division that patrols the New York State Thruway, uh, the, the Thruway troopers. Comple basically unnecessary. You, now you're going to need somebody on the highway to, to be ready for accidents, right? Which are going to be almost non-existent as well. Really unclear what the purpose of police becomes at that point. Brian says, children born today will never learn to drive a car nor own a car. That's pretty cool to contemplate. Yeah, I, I don't, wouldn't say just say children born today. I would say 10-year-olds today might never learn to drive a car or own a car. Um, Mitch says, both my nephews refused to, get, refused to get their licenses. One is 18, the other is 21. There's a lot of, I, I have a 20-year-old and a 16-year-old, and a lot of kids their age are deciding not to bother getting driver's licenses. They just don't want to do it. Like, it's crazy. When I was 16, it was like, I was dying to get my license. I, I think I did it, you know... The day I turned 16, I, you know, started the process. Uh, we all wanted to get, we want, we all wanted to drive when I was young. I think all of us, pretty much. So I, I think we're, it's a, it's an interesting uh, transition, but I really want to stress this, that all these stories that I'm telling you about drunk driving arrests and, you know, personal injury cases where people get badly hurt. I've seen spine injuries. I had a client who was, he it was, it's a crazy world. So he's, um. Uh, he had a 12-year-old marijuana case, and they finally found him, which is bizarre, because they'd actually found him twice before and not brought him in for this other thing, for this marijuana case. They, they find him, they arrest him, they throw him in the back of a, of a van, basically, tell him to lay on the back of the van, and then the, the, the guy falls asleep at the wheel and crashes, and my client and another guy in the back, they both end up needing spine surgery. He recovered pretty well and everything. I got a ton of money for him on that case. I made a lot of money on that case. It was stupid. It's a you know, ridiculous waste of societal resources. It's great that I made money. It's not good for society that this much money goes into paying for a surgery that shouldn't have been necessary, paying to, for lawyers to handle the case, giving this guy money that he's going to blow. <laughs> he's going to blow on a, a BMW or something. That he, whatever. Um, a lot of people who win personal injury cases or get big money on personal injury cases blow the money fast. They don't manage it well. I tried. I tried to help him. You know, can you imagine a world where we just eliminate the traffic? It's not just the 40,000 people killed a year in the United States or the million people killed in the world. What about all the injuries? What about all the people who lose a limb? What about all the people who have like permanent pain? They have back conditions. How much, you know, how much better the world's going to be? And then, you know, this transition, like, okay, we're not going to need as many chiropractors. By the way, I'm not a big fan of chiropractors. That's a long conversation. When you work as a defense lawyer for Allstate, you're trained to disbelieve in chiropractors. Maybe I'm biased. Maybe that bias is unfair, but I think the whole practice of chiropractic is mostly a waste of time and energy. I'm sure there's some fans of chiropractors out there who are going to disagree with me. I'm sorry. And, and I, maybe I'm wrong. Right? We want to be less wrong. I'm not wearing the be less wrong shirt. I'm wearing the Cybertruck shirt. ElonBits.com. You know, all the money spent on emergency room visits, all the money spent on orthopedic, all the money spent on orthopedic surgeries, neurologists, um, scars, you know, facial plastic surgery, other plastic surgery. There's a tremendous amount of money spent on... The medical side of car accidents is a tremendous amount of money spent on personal injury expenses. And Florida has like a dual medical system where if you're in a car accident, regular doctors won't see you. You got to go see somebody in the personal injury medical system. It's not official. It's just the practical reality. Um, Brian says the Brightline train has killed five people this month already. That goes away too. Yeah. In a robo taxi world, this is an interesting question. I think in a robo taxi world and especially in a boring company tunnel world, the trains die. The trains die, the planes die. I don't think I mentioned the train industry in my video, but I think the train industry also goes away. I think the boring company tunnel system, the Hyperloop system are going to be more efficient than trains, They're going to be more efficient than planes. Um, the bus, the buses are going to be gone. Uh, a lot of potential for saving a lot of money, saving a lot of lives, making life more efficient. And, you know, I think one of the things that just comes up is, I think I just tweeted this video on Twitter. There's this idea that if, you know, the cars drive themselves and, you know, robots proliferate or whatever, that all these people are going to lose jobs. I, I, I disagree with that mentality. You're going to wipe out a lot of industries. It's going to create a lot of new jobs. Everybody that saves $5,000 a year has $5,000 to spend on something else. And that creates jobs. And it generally creates more and better jobs. So a lot of good stuff there. So I'm trying to think if I have any other stories. 
I, I made a list of some stories. I've told you all the stories I had. Uh, I took notes on. I think we're about 48 minutes in. I think this is good enough. Um, I don't see any other uh, comments in the chat. So I want to thank everyone for watching. I think this was a, a... Oh, here we go. Victor says, I was pulled over on a rural road in Greene County, New York, near Albany. I'm, I'm familiar with Greene County. Cats, the the uh, village of Catskill is sort of the county seat for Greene County. It's in the, the Catskill Mountains or the Catskill... Yeah, the Catskill Mountains. About 3 a.m., they said I crossed the double yell, double line. It was bullshit. I didn't have a drink. It was about nine years ago. Cop says, how many drinks do you have? I said, none. He said, come on, tell me the truth. I said, I'm telling the truth. They gave me a field sobriety test and continue asking me the same questions. They had me sitting in the car a while. Finally, let me go. I was driving my vintage Chevelle. Yeah. Um, actually, my uh, a family member, I won't name him, was stopped. They claimed he ran a stop sign. Uh, this is an elderly family member. And they kept him at the traffic stop for 15 minutes or so, asking him questions, trying to get him to walk a line. This is a guy who's old enough. He probably couldn't walk a line anyway. Um, they ultimately let him go. But, you know, unfortunately, a lot of times that you have these traffic encounters and they don't let him go. And bad things happen. And, you know, with all the concerns about criminal justice and police interactions with minorities, the reality is police have bad interactions with white people, too. Is it worse with black people? Maybe I kind of waver on that one. I think it depends. But regardless, you know, one of the best ways we can reduce these bad encounters with police and minorities or police and, you know, bad police encounters in general is having fewer of them. So, you know, a great example would be Leslie. I mean, here's an interesting question. What happens to the war on drugs when you can't make a traffic stop? Like, uh, if you go to my channel, search my channel for peanut butter pretzels. There was this incident where a guy who's a public defender in, I want to say North Carolina, Tennessee, something like that. Public defenders don't make much money. So he's driving Uber when he's not working as a public defender. And he picks up somebody for a ride and he gets pulled over. And the police pulled him over because he picked somebody up from this house they were they suspected was involved in drug crime. And he's like, wait, that's not a basis for a traffic stop. Traffic stop is you committed a traffic violation. So this is a stretch for a traffic stop in the first place. And then they want to search the car. And he says, no, you're not searching my car because he's the lawyer. And he knows you can't search my car. And they bring the drug sniffing dog and the drug sniffing dog, you know, at some point, quote, indicates which and, and the, the, the lawyer is just hilarious watching this. It was a mess, you know, and there was nothing in the car. And, you know, but the way they treated this guy, they, they, they were telling him he couldn't film the encounter when he, the, the lawyer knows. No, Glick versus Massachusetts. I can film this encounter like there's there's court cases that say that, yes, you can record an encounter with police. So, you uh, you know, just all kinds of bad things happen in these encounters. And the, the, at some point, the, the defense lawyer says, you know, maybe he smelled peanut butter pretzels. And the cop says, the dog doesn't indicate on peanut butter pretzels or something like that. It's hilarious. So it's hilarious for me watching it later. I think actually the public defender thought it was hilarious too. Um, Jesse something. I think his name's Jesse. I can't remember his last name. Uh, Brian says it eliminates civil asset forfeiture. Eliminates civil asset forfeiture in cases involving traffic stops. There are civil asset forfeiture uh, incidents that do not involve traffic stops. But the drug war, I was getting this point, a lot of drug cases start with they pull somebody over and then they smell marijuana, which is often a lie. That's another conversation. Um, they smell something in the car and they search the car and they find drugs. They find drugs. Sometimes the I'm sorry. Some there are bad cops who will plant drugs in a car. They've been caught on film multiple times, so don't tell me it doesn't happen. Then the person gets arrested for a drug case. Well, what happens to all the drug cases when you easily half of drug cases start with a traffic stop? Easily half of all criminal cases start with a traffic. Just let me break down these numbers. First of all, there's 15,000 cases a month of just traffic cases in Palm Beach County. Yes, this is Mitch's point exactly. It kill, it's not that it kills probable cause as a reason for traffic stops. It's actually reasonable, reasonable suspicion for the stop and then probable cause for an arrest. The way, as I understand it, it works. You could argue it's probable cause for a traffic stop. I think it should be probable cause for a traffic stop. But sometimes a traffic stop can be based on reasonable suspicion. That's, that's complicated. Um, I might be wrong about that. I still think it should be probable cause for a traffic stop. You've got drunk driving is a big chunk of the cases. So a third of the cases, in, a third of the criminal cases in Palm Beach County are driving with a suspended license, and then you have driving without insurance, and you have driving without a with a without a with a suspended registration. So between driving with a suspended license, driving with without ins with a uh, without insurance, and driving with a suspended registration or license, and then drunk driving, you probably have half of all criminal cases right there. The only major criminal case that I see a lot of. Um, that wouldn't be wiped out by this is domestic violence and maybe shoplifting are the two of the most common 
uh, cases that are not related to traffic stops. Um, so you, you really wipe out a lot of criminal cases, and then you don't need as many criminal defense lawyers. You don't need as many prosecutors. You don't need as many police officers. You don't need as many judges. You don't need as many courthouses. You don't need as many public defenders. You, there's the amount of money that government could save if, this is a big if, if the politicians decide to eliminate those jobs. And the only way that happens is if you and get your friends and everybody else to start telling the politicians, hey, when, when the robo-taxi network goes live, when we start seeing a massive reduction in accidents and there's no genuine basis for traffic stops anymore, you have to talk to your friends and you have to push your friends to pressure politicians to eliminate those unnecessary jobs because they're, they're very, very reluctant to eliminate government jobs. At every level of government, if you tell a politician, hey, we don't need this job anymore, they don't want to do it. Well, we'll find something else for the police to do. Why? Why? If, if, they're, if their purpose is gone, let them go. Let them find something else to do. Bunch of questions here. New laws will be written to address robo-traffic robo violations. Most likely the politicians will find, will make up excuses to stop robo-taxis. I think that ultimately the Fourth Amendment will, I'd like to believe that the Fourth Amendment will be ruled favorably and the Supreme Court will basically take away their ability to stop robo-taxis because there's just no basis to stop a robo-taxi. They're inherently safe. If the, if the number of accidents goes to zero, then what's the point of stopping them? Um, P. Burns says, what happens if you're at fault and your Tesla cameras incriminate you? Well, what do you mean if you're at fault? If the car is driving and the car is at fault, then tough luck. If, if your cameras incriminate you, um, can the state use that evidence against you? Can you refuse to turn it over? No, you can't refuse to turn it over. The state will probably not ask for it. Who is at fault when the robo-taxi you're in kills a pedestrian? Uh, if Tesla's driving the car, Tesla's at fault. That simple. If Teslas are driving the car and the car is at fault, then the, then Tesla's at fault. Tesla's responsible. Um, if you do that now, the politicians won't allow robo taxis. Exactly. That's I mean that's the 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 biggest threat. When I say I say this a lot, the biggest threat to Tesla is government. But really, the biggest threat to us, to us having a safer, lower cost transportation system that saves a lot of lives and saves us a lot of money. The biggest threat to that is government. And in, in theory, at least, government is responsive to the will of the people. So if you tell your friends and I tell my friends and we all tell each other, we all get more and more people on board, we can get to the point where the politicians say, hey, let's get rid of this. Uh, yeah, you know, lawyers lawyers are going to fight this. And lawyers have a lot of political... And this is the thing. If we're silent, uh, the, the traffic lawyers are going to want traffic tickets to continue. The, the drunk driving defense lawyers are going to want drunk driving cases to continue. The, the marijuana lawyers are going to want marijuana cases to continue. The personal injury lawyers are going to want personal injury cases to continue. They all vote, and they all have friends who are politicians. So we have to be louder than them. Yes, memory Congress, many Congress and House members, many uh, state legislators, many uh, a lot of people. So lawyers make the laws, yes, but you know if we speak loudly, if we get together and we speak loudly, we can change this. And it's going to be really important because... The benefits of the robo taxi system are diminished if we still spend all that money on police. Because there's one of the big benefits is we don't need as many police, we don't need as many prosecutors, we don't need it. We can save taxpayer money, right? And and some of us would rather not waste taxpayer money on unnecessary things. Either you're going to spend the taxpayer money on something else, or you're going to give it back to the taxpayer. My choice would be to give it back to the taxpayer, um, and then. Those individuals are saving five thousand dollars a year on robo taxis. They're going to save another five hundred to a thousand dollars a year on on taxes, and traffic tickets, and other things that they're spending money on. And traffic lawyers, all the stuff that, that people are spending money on, we're saving money, and that money can go to create new jobs. Yeah, Mitch says, imagine your job is to set your own pay rate and benefits. Enough said. Yeah, and I would say not just lawyers make the laws. The police aren't going to want the police jobs to go away. The the the, the corrections officers aren't going to want the prison jobs to go away. All that's there. So. All right, so we're approaching an hour. Um, I feel like I've run out of material. I probably could tell more. Maybe I'll do another video in the future where, where I think of some other lawyer stories to tell. Um, I want to thank everybody for participating. Uh, you know, I, particularly Brian, my, my friend Brian's in the chat. Uh, Kara's in the chat, my girlfriend. Um, Mitch, thank, th I want to thank everyone for participating. So I'm going to record, I'm, gonna, I'm recording this now. I'm going to edit this recording and post it on YouTube tomorrow. We'll do a live chat tomorrow there as well. Uh, I hope this went well. I want to thank everybody for participating. And uh, we'll see you again soon on The Daily Lie. Uh, certainly Sunday, if not sooner. A Sunday, I might push the, the, the Daily Lie from Sunday to Monday because I'm going to be vacationing in the Florida Keys. So thanks, everyone.